When you retire, you may get a chance to go to football heaven. This is football heaven. Now joining me uh, in the booth for his uh, first year on Monday night, as well as with Steve Levy, although they were partners for four years on college football. I have to say this, Brian, son of Hall of Famer Bob Greasy, since we're here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but now in your own right, uh, entering the broadcasting phase that could lead to the Pete Rosell Award here on Monday Night Football. Brian Greasy, thanks for being here on the mission. Uh, it's my it's my pleasure. The Hall of Fame holds a special place in my heart. So anything I can do. I'm assuming you've been. I have. So what was it like? In what year? What were your memories of? And was it enshrinement that you came to the hall? Uh, yeah, I've been there several times. Uh, the first time that I went to Canton, Ohio, uh, was in 1990. I was uh, 15 years old, uh, and my dad was being enshrined in the Hall of Fame, and. Um, for the first time for me to go at that age, you know, with my dad going in, um, you know, I, it, I don't, I don't know how to put it into words. I mean, the first time to actually go through the hall and to see all the names, uh, and at that age, you're so impressionable, and I just love the sport of football, uh, and to see my dad go in um, and to be sitting in the front row, you know, outside at, at that the ceremony, um, it's a, it's an experience I will never forget. That's for sure. You know, my son is sitting down here, my three sons, but the youngest one is the wisest one. I think he, since he and I are home together now, he uh, kind of needles me like I needle him. And he often told me that um, one of the things I'm remembered for most are my glasses. And my glasses have been in here for 10 years. And he says, Dad, that's as close as you're ever going to get to the Hall of Fame. In your face, Brian. Uh, your dad was also in the great line of incredible Purdue quarterbacks. I mean, you've got Lenny Dawson, you've got Drew Brees. How did he feel when you went to Michigan? <laughs> um, you know, I talked, I talked for a while with my dad about it. And, um, you know, I had a, an offer to go to Purdue. Uh, and I said, you know, dad, um, it would be kind of hard to go to Purdue um, following your footsteps. You know, where did, where did your dad live? You know, what did he, uh, where did he uh, study? Um, all those kinds of things. The comparisons would have been just one-to-one. -one. Um, but I think I won out when I told him that, you know, Dad, I don't want to be an engineer. So uh, <laughs> I, think I'll go to, I think I'll go to Michigan. No suit for you. And the 97 championship, the first in the half a century Michigan. Tell us a little bit how that season was. Well, it was an unbelievable season. Um, you know, I, uh, I didn't start my senior year, my fourth year at Michigan. Um, and so I had to kind of wait my turn and uh, didn't know if I was going to come back my fifth year. Uh, there were younger players uh, that were uh, coming up behind me. So nothing was um, guaranteed for me to be a starter for Michigan that year. There were some younger players underneath me. You might have heard of them, like Tom Brady and some of those guys. Um, but I decided to come back and, um, and dedicated myself. And, and we had a special season um, led by uh, one of the uh, young men that's going to be going into the Hall of Fame very soon in Charles Woodson. So, and Steve Hutchinson, for that matter. So uh, two Hall of Famers uh, on that team uh, in 97. So it was, it was a memorable year. And to bring a championship to Michigan for the first time in 50 years um, was pretty special. Um, well, first of all, we invite you, Lewis, um, uh, Lisa, and uh, Steve to come to next year's enshrinement. I think Charles Woodson is a lock behind Peyton Manning. Yeah. Um, and we'd love to have you guys there. Um, and we'd love to have you back for a visit at any time you want to come. Steve mentioned his twin boys. They're really excited. That's the thing on their bucket list. You're going to find it really incredibly different. We have a hologram show, et cetera. And, uh, you know, uh, you can take a look at those Pete Rosell Award winners. And, you know, you guys being Monday night, you know, you put yourself in that position. You saw we surprised on the air uh, Joe Buck with the Pete Rosell Award. We did that at halftime. So you got to be careful of seeing David Baker anywhere in your shadow. Because <laughs> that guy is around, you never know what he's going to hit you with some surprise. So, but please, we welcome you to enshrinement. Tell us about 
the big difference on being in football's longest running, biggest primetime stage show? Well, M Monday night is an institution and um, it's uh, been around for 50 years for a reason. And uh, you, you can't say enough about uh, the way it started in Rune Arledge, uh, taking a chance uh, on putting uh, NFL football in primetime on Monday night and, and how people were going to respond to it. And um, I think that, you know, for as long as I've been alive, obviously, uh, I've been watching Monday night football and I, I still have memories growing up. 1985 was my favorite Monday night game of all time when the Chicago Bears come into um, Dolphin Stadium undefeated and uh, play on Monday night against Dan Marino and Nat Moore and Don Shula and all of the 72 team is lined up before the game on the sidelines and you could just feel the energy in the stadium. I remember that as a 10 year old being there at the game and um, so I, I have so many wonderful memories of Monday night. And, and honestly, Joy, I feel so fortunate to be a part of Monday night football now, especially in 2020 with everything that we're going through um, and how important the NFL and the game is to the fans, um, to give them something to look forward to as we go through uh, this very, very difficult year. Um, I view it as a, as a real honor to, to be a part of it, um, to tell the stories of the players, on and off the field with respect to social justice issues as well. Um, so it's a very critical time uh, and I'm really fortunate to be in the position I am. Who called you up from Furious Monday Night uh, alumni to sort of give you a heads up on the big difference it would be when you're going from a million watching you guys on college football to 16 to 19 million and a much more diverse audience across the board? You know, I didn't, didn't have, obviously, this conversation when I, when I got the job, but um, a lot of people don't remember the very first voice of Monday Night Football was Keith Jackson. And um, Keith Jackson was a very important person to me. I uh, was obviously um, uh, partners with my dad for many, many years on college football. Uh, and I learned a lot uh, just being around Keith Jackson and my dad calling games. Um, and so I would say that you know, outside of, outside of my father, Keith probably had the biggest influence on, on my time as a broadcaster um, and really understanding uh, what it means to uh, talk less but say more. And it's never about you in the booth. It's about the game on the field. Um, it's about the individual stories of the players uh, and the impact they're making both on and off the field. And you're there to accentuate the game. Um, so by far, uh, he was the biggest influence of, of anybody that's been in the Monday night booth. There's been a lot of other, uh, you know, folks that, that I've known and, and had conversations with. You know, I, I have a fellow alum in Dan Deardorff, who was a wonderful Monday night analyst for many, many years. And so um, I, it's not lost on me, the number of, of a Hall of Fame, uh, both players and broadcasters that have been in that seat uh, that I can learn from and, and uh, take what they've done and established, really standing on the, uh, shoulders of many that have come before us. And, you know, Dan had the second or third longest ran on Monday night, which was amazing. Uh, uh, and really sort of, uh, he, he and Madden as offensive linemen having that streak is something unusual because he usually goes to the quarterbacks. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of quarterbacks didn't really last that long in the booth. Not saying that's going to be you, but the Joe Namus of the world who tried their shot at it. Um, and, you know, Gruden was a coach. Uh, in there for a long time. For you, what's it like? You've got Steve, who you know, but working with Lewis, how's that mesh coming uh, in terms of your team? You know, I think we are, uh, we, we're just coming out of our preseason, if you will, after five games. Um, but I think that, um, I think we've, we've tried to approach uh, this year in Monday Night Football uh, really as bringing the game to the fans, right? And not tr not trying to be anything more than uh, the conduit to bring the game. Uh, and, and as you watch the game, hopefully uh, there's entertainment value, certainly, uh, but you're learning something, uh, you're enjoying, we're having fun, there's, there's chemistry, there's back and forth. Um, and I think we've, we've begun to build on that. And I think Lewis brings a, a wealth of information and knowledge, a different perspective than mine from the defensive side um, and from the front office perspective, which I think is interesting. Um, and so there's some play back and forth there that I think is, is great. And, and Steve brings a, a wonderful 
uh, perspective. He's uh, none of us take ourselves too seriously. I think that's important. I think it's important to check your ego at the door uh, when you're walking into that booth um, and you're there to service the fan. Uh, and there's no bigger fan of the NFL than Steve Levy. And so he kind of plays that role as a fan at home, asking us questions about what different terminology means or what to do in different situations. So uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good mix. And um, I know this, we're having a lot of fun and uh, hopefully you can hear that at home. And I hear it in your voice tonight. I mean, look, you guys have really one of the best schedules in a long time. You opened up with the Ravens and the Chiefs, the two marquee quarterbacks. What are the other games you're looking forward to? And how does that really change for you, the dynamic? I mean, that's got to be a big pump up to know that, like, every week you've got something there that's meaningful, people care about. And as you said, you guys and the NFL is paving the way for the country to keep pushing forward. It's got a, a dual sword to this thing. It's not just a great game, but it's also a great statement to the nation on how the NFL and television is forging ahead. The schedule has been fantastic. I mean, we, we've had great games already um, to open up uh, the very first game ever played in Las Vegas in Allegiant Stadium was a ton of fun. When Drew Brees comes into town, uh, that was exciting. And then you mentioned Baltimore and Kansas City with the past two MVPs. Uh, last week was a ton of fun, a close game uh, to, to call that game with, with one of the budding stars and Justin Herbert for the Chargers uh, coming into the Superdome against Drew Brees. I'm excited about this Monday night. You know what? What are the Dallas Cowboys going to be? What are they going to be without Dak Prescott? Uh, and then another emerging star in Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, there's a lot of great games coming up. I'm looking forward to going to the new stadium, SoFi in Los Angeles, to cover the Rams next week. Uh, we've got Tom Brady the Bucs two times towards the end of the year. Uh, we're going to do uh, Pittsburgh and, and um, uh, Cincinnati. We're going to do – we're going to – we got a bunch of games coming up that I think are going to have playoff implications. The Patriots bills at the end of the year, which could uh, people looked at at the beginning of the year and wondered whether that would be for the division. And it looks like it may be. So uh, the schedule has been great. Um, 17 weeks of nonstop action. I couldn't ask for much more. And if you can, for our fans of Northeast Ohio, though, we're national. Talk a little bit about the Browns. You've got the Ravens and the Browns uh, coming up. Oh, well, how do you see them in the mix here? Yeah, I just got done watching tape of, of the Browns uh, beating up on, on the Cowboys. And, and uh, you know, it was uh, very impressive uh, to watch Baker Mayfield and what, what he's done. I think Kevin Stefanski and the system that he has brought to Cleveland, I'm very familiar with because it came straight from Gary Kubiak in Minnesota. Gary Kubiak was my coach in Denver. Uh, I think it's a system that is proliferating throughout the NFL. Uh, from Mike Shanahan and that tree, you see what Kyle Shanahan is doing in San Francisco. Sean McVay is doing it in Los Angeles. And now you're watching Baker Mayfield uh, with a system that I think is tailor fit to what he does well, have a solid run game, and then play action off of it. Um, I think it fits him to a tee and um, takes some pressure off of him, not having to drop back 35 times a game and, and throw the football. So um, I'm, I'm excited to see what Cleveland can do. They have to continue to build and get better. Um, and Baltimore doesn't look quite as dominant as they did a year ago. So that'll be a fun one. Um, I think you saw the tape or the unveiling of what we built downtown in Canton, Centennial yeah. Plaza, which is a, uh, the city of Canton, uh, which calls itself the Hall of Fame city. The game was born there in 1920. The Hall of Fame was born in 1963 there. They've now built this, and this is a monument to the 25,488 who played the game. When you come to Canton, you must go down there because there are 11 monuments that have the names of every single player that's ever played the game. And then we will have a time capsule as well. And, you know, you've been to enshrinement, but the city of Canton, they're all about Hall of Fame treatment. They love the people who come there. They love them up as well and so we welcome you to come on your next trip back come visit us come to the next enshrinement but we want to tell you how much uh, we love your dad I, I i worked with your dad uh since i've come to the hall in 09 uh, after he was a broadcaster i actually went down to evansville did a hometown hall of famer program with him just an absolute uh, class person and i could see it in you and the fact that you got mentored by keith jackson 
that's really pretty good early Monday night football. <laughs> well, I, I'm really excited to come see the, the exhibit. Uh, I think it's a great idea. You know, when, when we watch, we listen to the speeches for the inductees every single year. Uh, they always mention, right, the teammates, all the people that go into making a Hall of Fame career. Um, and I think it's, it's critical and, uh, and so needed and smart uh, to recognize everybody that's played in the National Football League because every single player that's played has had an impact. Um, and, you know, typically there's – for every one enshrinee, there's hundreds of other players that will never receive that recognition. And, but they're no less important, I think, to the game of football and to the NFL in particular. Um, and it'll be a great way, a great thing for those players to bring their families back to Canton um, to see their names um, etched in stone. I think it's, uh, it's phenomenal, and I can't wait to come back and see it. We well, appreciate that. And as you know, the Hall has the record of every NFL player that played. We have an archive. If you come to the Hall, we can pull archival items that you have. You know, we get archives every week from players breaking records in the National Football League. You know, we're the guardians of the game, we're the historians of the game, $40 million documents, 6 million photos. And by the way, tonight, what we're doing with you guys is history because we have the Pete Rosell Award. Uh, your statements and what you're talking about, the game will live forever. We're keepers of the flame. This won't just disappear after a, a newscast in deference. And that's why we wanted to have you guys on because you really now are part of the history of the game because we will continue to honor you. And by the way, you should pass this on. I'll have to talk to Seth Markman. There's a full exhibit for Sunday night football. We <laughs> desperately need the Monday night football exhibit in the Hall of Fame. So please pass it on to your colleagues. I will. And I, so I have a question for you, George. Do you sure. still, you have all these, this memorabilia from, uh, from many, many years. Do you still have my dad's glasses? You know, the glasses that yes. were the first glasses ever worn? You know what? When I, I will show you what we have of your dad, actually. Um, I will go back and have our archives to pull it, and I'll send you photos. And okay. it'll blow you away. So when he, when he you know, gave his speech in enshrinement, he told the story of the glasses and how, you know, he, he would come off the field and, and Shula would look at his glasses, and my dad would have to clean the glasses, and Shula's looking at the – the clock, you know, he's like, listen, Bob, can you hurry it up? We got to get back out there and call a play before the clock runs down. And so my dad said, well, so he finally had a solution. He brought out at the enshrinement, he brought out these glasses and put them on and they had windshield wipers on. <laughs> the great moments of enshrinement. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And we, and unfortunately, we just had the passing of uh, Fred Dean. Yes. But he had a similar moment. In enshrinement. By the way, it, when you come, because I know you're really a football, you love football and you love everything about the game. Those speeches you talk about, oh. we have been using them, watching them for years. They are priceless in many, many ways. This one was a great one. Halfway through his speech, Fred Dean turned around and says, hey, I can't read this. I forgot my glasses. And then Barney brought him his glasses on the stage. <laughs> But your dad's with the windshield wipers was actually a better moment. That was terrific. We'll send you that. Do you have that clip? Well, that I was, I was, listen, George, I was so emotional sitting there, 15 years old, in the front row, and I was so emotional. I'm crying because I'm so proud and happy. And then at that moment where I start to cry, right, my dad makes light of it. He makes a joke of it. So I'm laughing. I'm crying. I mean, 15 years old, like, uh, he just, he killed me. So I'll, I'll never forget it. We'll send you the clip. You're on the list. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you for the hey, time. Good luck with the rest of the All right, take care.